Hello, my name is Don Tyndall. I'm a professor of biochemistry, molecular biology, and urology at Mayo Clinic. I'm a basic scientist. I'm not a clinician. And uh, my research interests are in the mechanism of androgen action and the mechanisms by which androgens promote prostate cancer progression. I obtained my BS degree from University of South Carolina, my master's degree from the University of Clemson, and my PhD from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Before I came to Mayo, I was at Baylor College of Medicine uh, in the Department of Cell Biology in Houston, Texas. During my presentation, please type in your questions and I will be happy to address them following my presentation. There are several disclosures I have. Um, I have acted as a consultant for and received research support from the following companies, GlaxoSmithKline, Beckman Coulter, Millennium, and Medivation. The terms of these arrangements have been reviewed and approved by Mayo Clinic in accordance with its policy on objectivity in research. Prostate cancer is a devastating disease and this slide shows the prevalence of uh, prostate cancer. Uh, the uh, rate uh, of diagnosis in the left hand slide uh, showing that prostate uh, cancer uh, is one of the uh, highest diagnosed disease in males in the United States, uh, where it rates uh, second only to lung and bronchial cancer uh, in its uh, detection rate. There are some key concepts I would like to present today. So these are the take-home messages. One is that prostate needs androgen receptor to survive. The second key concept is that following androgen ablation therapy, prostate cancer cells develop androgen independent mechanisms to activate the androgen receptor. The third is that the androgen receptor is activated at one end by androgens and at the other end by androgen independent mechanisms. And finally, uh, androgen receptor variants are activated only by androgen independent mechanisms. So for the first concept that the prostate needs androgen receptor to survive. This is a schematic showing the progression uh, from normal prostate to prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia, so-called PIN lesions. These are considered pre-neoplastic lesions. Next to well-differentiated prostate cancer, then to poorly differentiated prostate cancer, and finally to metastatic prostate cancer. And the important point here is that the androgen receptor plays a major role at each of these steps of differentiation of the normal prostate into cancerous states. And this slide shows some of the key genes that are androgen regulated along these pathways. These include uh, a gene called NKX3 Point one, which also is critical for differentiation of the prostate. There are ETS fusion genes. Uh, these are uh, ETS oncogenes that are fused to an androgen response element that is important for the initial development of these lesions. Then there's P27, P53, the retinoblastoma gene, and telomerase are also involved in development of well-differentiated prostate cancer. Following that, P10, 
a nex and a seven are and important for development of poorly differentiated prostate cancer and finally cmyk interleukin six the p i three kinase a k t pathway are involved in development of metastatic prostate cancer and although i show this as a linear scheme in reality these genes can be expressed at different phases and play important roles in all the different phases so but this is a rather simplistic way of thinking about it at the current time now we have methods of inhibiting some of these lesions for instance inhibitors of 5 alpha reductase enzymes has been demonstrated in several clinical trials to in to inhibit the initial development of prostate cancer we also inhibit have inhibitors of androgen synthesis and inhibitors of the androgen receptor that can inhibit various stops along this pathway this slide shows schematically the mechanism by which androgens enter prostate cancer cells and induce transcription of genes that are involved in progression of prostate cancer testosterone is bound in the serum to a protein called six hormone binding globulin uh, testosterone can enter a prostate cell uh, by passive diffusion it's a very hydrophobic molecule and a very important uh, conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone or DHT occurs within the cytoplasm of the prostate cells 5 alpha reductase enzymes are important for this conversion and inhibiting these enzymes can uh, lead to a reduction uh, in uh, in prostate cancer in patients dihydrotestosterone uh, can now bind to the androgen receptor uh, this causes a conformational change in the receptor and release of heat shock proteins which have protected the unligated uh, unliganded receptor up until this point from degradation once the receptor binds to dihydrotestosterone uh, it can dimerize it then enters the nucleus where it binds to specific elements on DNA called androgen response elements once it binds to these androgen response elements it recruits coactivator proteins such as ARA70 and then this allows uh, relaxation of the chromatin allowing other uh, transcription factors to uh, engage with the uh, target genes and increase uh, transcription of these target genes these genes are largely involved with growth and survival and prostate specific antigen uh, although uh, it's uh, not thought to be involved in progression of prostate cancer it's been a very significant marker for the detection of prostate cancer so PSA is an androgen regulated gene this slide depicts the uh, structure of the androgen receptor uh, the androgen receptor is coded far on the X chromosome uh, the XQ11 region of the chromosome uh, this gene codes for a transcript that contains uh, that's from eight exons and uh, then these transcripts code for the protein which is shown 
uh, at the lower part of the slide. The protein has an amino terminal domain on the left-hand side, a DNA binding domain, which is in yellow. There's a small hinge region, and I will describe this later, and then the ligand binding domain or the androgen binding domain. So this is the region that binds to the steroid dihydrotestosterone. Again, we see the structure of the receptor and on the left-hand uh, portion uh, is the transactivation domain of the receptor. That's next to the DNA binding domain, which is responsible for binding to these androgen response elements on the DNA. The hinge region allows the androgen binding domain to fold back onto the uh, DNA binding domain and inhibit its activity. As I mentioned, we have, uh, we have drugs that can inhibit the synthesis of androgens uh, in synthesis of dihydrotestosterone. Uh, that you can also accomplish this by surgical castration or orchiectomy. We also have drugs that can inhibit binding of the dihydrotestosterone to the androgen receptor. And these are referred to as antiandrogens. So the next key concept is that following androgen ablation therapy, prostate cancer cells develop androgen independent mechanisms to activate the androgen receptor. And this is shown schematically here where uh, we're depicting the progression of prostate cancer from an androgen dependent phase or AD phase to castration resistant prostate cancer or CRPC shown at the top of the slide. Tumor burden can be monitored by PSA levels and during the initial uh, growth of prostate cancer, uh, these are largely androgen uh, dependent cells and so tumor burden increases with time in the presence of androgens. However, the, one of the most common treatments for advanced prostate cancer is androgen ablation therapy. And this therapy is very effective for a period of time. So you can see from this slide that following androgen ablation, PSA levels and tumor burden uh, will decrease for a period of time. However, the problem is that eventually tumor burden returns. And this is what my laboratory has been interested in. How can these prostate cancer cells survive in the absence of androgens uh, even though they've depended on androgens for their entire lifespan? We've got some very effective animal models and cell models that can recapitulate the human uh, condition. This cell line called the um, LNCAP cell, which stands for lymph node cancer of the prostate, uh, it was grown with bone fibroblasts in a nude in, in a nude mouse. The tumors were allowed to grow over a period of eight weeks, and then uh, these mice were castrated. And the tumors initially regressed, as we see in the clinic, but after a period of time, they began to grow again. So this stage recapitulates what we see in the clinic in this animal model. The tumors were removed 
at this point and grown in culture and a c four cell line was developed from these tumors. Then the C4 cell line was again put back into mice uh, with bone fibroblast and the entire process was uh, repeated and a more aggressive prostate tumor developed and the, these tumors were removed and put in culture and they are called C4-2 cells. They exhibit androgen independent growth. However, a very important feature of these cells is they still uh, contain androgen receptors and they're still dependent on these androgen receptors for their growth, even though we can remove all androgens from the culture medium. And they express prostate-specific genes, such as PSA. This slide depicts uh, PSA message expression at the top of the slide in the androgen-dependent LNCAP cells and the castration-resistant C42 cells. We used a um, synthetic androgen called mybolarone, which is shown at the bottom of the slide. And uh, in the absence of androgen, you can see that there is virtually no expression of PSA message. However, in the presence of androgen, this message is highly stimulated in the androgen-dependent cells. The most important lane on this slide is the castration-resistant cells in the absence of androgens. You can see this androgen-dependent gene is still stimulated even in the total absence of androgens. And we've shown that this stimulation is still dependent on the androgen receptor in these cells. Nonetheless, if we add androgens to these cells, we still see a robust androgen-dependent expression of this gene. So it's this androgen-independent constitutive activity of androgen responsive genes and growth of these cells that we are interested in understanding. Now, a number of mechanisms uh, can attribute or help explain uh, how these cells uh, survive in the absence of androgens. One is an androgen-dependent mechanism. One is ligand uh, hypersensitization, if you will. And one is androgen-independent. So this, let's first look at the uh, androgen-dependent uh, mechanism. And uh, I'm just going to give you uh, one example of each of these mechanisms so that you get a flavor of the research that underlines, uh, underlies these statements. So um, a very uh, important uh, finding uh, a num about uh, seven years ago, maybe 10 years ago, uh, was that these prostate cancer cells following androgen ablation can synthesize their own androgens. And this shows schematically the uh, mechanism by which adrenal androgens are converted to testosterone and dihydrotestosterone within the prostate cancer cells themselves. <clears throat> 
And this next slide shows some data from Dr. Moeller's lab uh, that indicates uh, that hormone naive prostate cancers, and these are from patients in the clinic, uh, still uh, have the capability uh, of producing testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. And you can see that the castration resistant tumors still have appreciable levels of both testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. I think this was a very important finding and it helps explain how these cells survive following androgen deprivation therapy. I will next discuss some um, ligand hypersensitization uh, experiments that can also help explain how these cells survive. One is through amplification of the androgen receptor itself. And this slide shows some data from Dr. Charles Sawyer's laboratory uh, when he was at UCLA whereby they took a number of castration-resistant um, xenografts. These are tumors that are growing in uh, these mice, uh, similar to what I've shown you previously. In fact, uh, this is the uh, xenograph from the LNCAP cell. And the left-hand column shows uh, tumors grown uh, in, um, uh, in a hormone-sensitive manner where the mice have not been castrated. And the, um, the lanes on the right shows uh, tumors from hormone-resistant or castration-resistant tumors. Uh, that uh, very similar to what I just showed you. And you can see that um, in the LNCAP uh, tumor xenograph that the hormone refractory or castration resistant tumors express more androgen receptor. And the interesting observation was that in every one of these xenograph models, there was more androgen receptor expressed in each of these tumors. Another explanation uh, is due to uh, cofactor deregulation. I showed you earlier schematically that these cofactors are recruited to the hormone uh, response elements on target genes by the androgen receptor. Now, although this slide is, uh, is rather complicated, uh, in fact, it's uh, fairly simple because these, these lines uh, that are horizontal show the binding area in the androgen receptor to which uh, each of these cofactors bind. So at the top of the slide, you see a number of cofactors that bind to the uh, left portion of the receptor or the transactivation domain. And in the right part of the slide, you see uh, a number of cofactors that bind to the ligand binding domain or the androgen binding domain portion of the receptor. Now, to date, more than uh, 180 cofactors have been described that are important for uh, regulating uh, these genes in uh, prostate cells. And our job is to define which ones are critical for progression of prostate cancer uh, and 
what is the mechanism by which they accomplish this regulation? Now, we already have some clues as to how this happens, because when we look at expression of these cofactors, we find that some of them are upregulated in prostate cancer. And so the hypothesis is that uh, the increased expression of these cofactors enable the androgen receptor to become more activated uh, as these tumors progress. And then the other concept that's important here is that there's important crosstalk signaling with other uh, signaling mechanisms in uh, these prostate cancer cells. And I'm just going to show you one mechanism, uh, which is the TNF-alpha uh, pathway that is known to have crosstalk with the androgen receptor. We're interested in the TNF-alpha pathway because it's important in differentiation, proliferation, and apoptosis, or cell killing, uh, in these cells. We know that uh, the TNF-alpha uh, pathway is uh, uh, elevated in prostate uh, epithelial cells and it's increased expression uh, in prostate cancer. This shows that this pathway uh, is involved in both proliferation and apoptosis in these cells. And we know that some of the genes are critical. And one that we focused on in our lab is called TRAD, T-R-A-D-D. This shows um, a schematic that uh, schematically that TRAD is induced by TNF-alpha. And there's both negative regulation of the androgen receptor and reverse regulate, positive regulation by the androgen receptor uh, in these cells. And I'm just going to show you one uh, experiment, one small piece of data uh, where uh, the um, uh, expression of uh, androgen receptor transcriptional activity uh, is modulated by the TNF-alpha pathway. Uh, first, you can see that in the absence of androgens or TNF-alpha, there's very little expression of the androgen receptor. However, in the presence of androgens, there's a, a dramatic increase uh, in transcriptional activity of the receptor. In the absence uh, of uh, androgens and in the presence of TRAD, uh, there's uh, very little uh, expression. However, in the presence of both androgens and TNF-alpha, you can see that this androgen stimulation of transcriptional activity is largely modified uh, by TNF-alpha expression. And finally, there are androgen-independent mechanisms which uh, affect activity of the androgen receptor. They're both androgen receptor mutations as well as alternative splicing of the androgen receptor. This shows some of the androgen receptor mutations that have been described and measured in prostate cancer cells. And these mutations are very interesting because rather than um, inhibiting the function of the androgen receptor, there's gain of function with many of these mutations. And this gain of function is that the androgen receptor is, uh, attains the ability to bind to other androgens, such as those that come from the adrenal gland. And so these adrenal androgens, which uh, normally do not activate the androgen receptor, uh, can now activate the androgen receptor. There are other mutations that are even more interesting. These mutations allow an antiandrogen 
to become an agonist. In other words, the therapy that was used to inhibit the androgen receptor can now bind to the androgen receptor and induce activation of the androgen receptor. So uh, these are very important in the clinic to understand. Now, before I get to androgen receptor variants, I want to uh, raise another key concept, and that is the androgen receptor is activated at one end, and you've already seen that the steroid uh, binding domain is important for this activation. And at the other end of the molecule, it can be activated by androgen independent mechanisms. And this is shown schematically here, where this, uh, in the um, absence of androgen, this hinge region allows the androgen binding domain to fold back over onto the DNA binding domain and prevent it from activating genes. Once DHT or androgen bind to the uh, androgen binding domain, it changes the conformational, uh, it changes the conformation of the protein such that this steroid binding domain uh, exposes or uh, folds back from the DNA binding domain and allows the DNA binding domain to become activated. And an important experiment that was done very early after the androgen receptor gene had been cloned was that if you remove entirely this steroid binding domain, what's left becomes constitutively active. So it binds to androgen response elements. It can activate target genes all in the complete absence of androgens. And so our laboratory began exploring the different motifs of the androgen receptor. And we began at the, the right hand portion of the molecule, the steroid binding domain. And this portion of the molecule is highly structured. And you can see that structure uh, here schematically, uh, this is from the crystallographic uh, measurements that have been made uh, from this end of the molecule entirely. And because of this structure, we know that there are specific amino acids in this region that are critical for binding uh, of the androgen and critical for activating the, um, the receptor. So I'm showing you one experiment here uh, where the, um, uh, there's a uh, reporter construct. A uh, reporter construct is one in which it has an androgen binding domain uh, hooked to a luciferase uh, expression vector. And so whenever luciferase is expressed, we, we know that the um, androgen receptor is bound to this androgen response element and induce activation of the gene. Um, you can see that uh, the wild type, uh, the full length wild type androgen receptor has robust androgen uh, dependent activity. And then if we mutate uh, any one of these amino acids, we see a reduction in this androgen dependent activity. However, when we looked at these same mutations in the androgen receptor, uh, in this 
castration resistant cell line, we see constitutive activity of the wild type receptor, but none of the other uh, mutations uh, abrogate significantly this activity. And so this experiment and many other experiments uh, led us to the hypothesis that this steroid binding domain is very critical for this androgen dependent activity. But as cells progress to this castration resistant phenotype, this portion of the receptor becomes less and less important. So therefore, we focused our attention on the other portion of the receptor, and that is this, uh, this region of the receptor. And this region of the receptor is highly unstructured as opposed to the steroid binding domain. And because of that unstructured nature, uh, it has not been crystallized, and therefore we, very, we know very little about the, uh, the regions that are critical for this transactivation. However, we can cut out regions of this receptor, and when we, uh, when we uh, focused on this region, which we call tau-5 or transactivating unit 5, we were able to show a, a large reduction, about 50% of transcription activity in these castration resistant cells. Here you see this constitutive activity with the full length wild type receptor and when the tau-5 region was cut out, you see about 50% 50 redu reduction in this castration-resistant um, constitutive activity. If we, um, if we look at the amino acids, uh, so we do a um, computer program that, uh, uh, that examines these amino acids in the context of their surroundings, we do find some regions that appear to have some secondary structure. Interestingly, when we cut out one of these regions, we can show that this region has a reduction in this constitutive activity that's equivalent to the entire tau-5 region. And so the conclusion from this and many, many other experiments is that this region of the receptor, although is not very important for the androgen dependent activity, becomes more and more important as we progress to this castration resistant uh, constitutive activity. And that brings us to our final key concept, and that is that androgen receptor variants, which I will tell you about shortly, are activated only by androgen independent mechanisms. Now I'm gonna tell you the take home message before I show you the data. And that is that these variants Let me get my pointer back. Well, apparently I've lost my, let's try, okay. I've lost my pointer, so uh, I'll just have to describe uh, uh, what's going on here. Uh, let me try one more thing. Okay, got my pointer back. So, um, these variants uh, were discovered uh, in a cell, in a castration resistant cell line 
grown under completely androgen independent mechanisms. And the common feature of all of these variants is that they lacked completely this androgen binding domain. Now, as we've already seen, such variants, such mutated proteins, are ligand independent or androgen independent, and they are constitutively active. And so I'll show you how we discovered these variants and what the data looks like from clinical samples. When we first um, uh, discovered these, we were looking at a cell line called the 22RB1 cell line. And this is a castration resistant cell line that is very similar to the LNCAP castration resistant uh, cell line. Interestingly, in addition to the let me see if I can get my pointer back. Well, I'm having problems getting a pointer, so I'll just carry on here. Um, so uh, on the right hand side is what we call the western blot and uh, this is what we use to separate proteins on a gel and then we uh, use antibodies to detect specific uh, proteins on that gel and at the top uh, of the gel you can see the uh, full length or wild type androgen receptor and underneath that you can see smaller forms of the androgen receptor and we know those are smaller forms of the androgen receptor uh, by a number of control uh, experiments. Now in order to um, examine uh, the role of the androgen receptor in these castration resistant um, cells we used small interference RNAs and these uh, bind to and inhibit uh, very specifically messenger RNAs uh, of target genes. So we used a small interference RNA uh, specifically against the androgen receptor and we know that if we use a um, target uh, against a target site such as exon 7 on the androgen receptor uh, that this can uh, inhibit expression of that messenger RNA. Well, the surprise came when we used this siRNA against exon 7 and we were able to knock down the large form of the receptor, which is the uh, full length androgen receptor, but these smaller forms of the androgen receptor remained and when we looked at the transcription activity of these uh, forms of the receptor, we found that even though we were able to knock down the, um, uh, the transcriptional, the androgen dependent transcription, we still had this constitutive activity of the receptor remaining. Let me see if I can get my pointer back. Oh, there we go. Okay. And uh, so here we can see that um, in the absence of siRNA, we've got robust androgen-dependent activation of the receptor. We also have the full-length androgen receptor and these smaller forms. However, when we use uh, this siRNA against uh, exon 7, we were only able to knock down this full length receptor, but the smaller form remained. And this constitutive activity remained. So this, uh, this was very uh, surprising to us, and it led uh, to uh, the next experiment where we used an siRNA against exon 1. 
when we used this siRNA, we were able to knock down both this larger form of the receptor as well as these smaller forms of the receptor. And when we looked at transcriptional activity, now we've knocked down all of the activity. So the conclusion from this experiment, which was very surprising to us, was this constitutive activity is due to these smaller forms of the receptor, and we call these splice variants of the androgen receptor. Well, uh, now we, were, we started a search on the entire gene, so we did, did genomic sequencing of this entire region of the gene that codes for the androgen receptor, and we found uh, a novel exon. Exons uh, code for the protein, and this novel exon, or what we call a cryptic exon, was downstream of the second exon of the gene. And this is in the region of the DNA binding domain. And now that we knew this, uh, and another point is that this cryptic exon calls, causes premature uh, abrogation of the transcription of the gene, and therefore you end up with a smaller uh, transcript or a smaller messenger RNA that will code for a smaller pro uh, protein. Now that we know the sequence of these variants, of the variant transcripts, we can produce siRNAs specifically against these cryptic exons. And when we use an siRNA specifically against cryptic exon 2b, we could knock down these smaller forms of the receptor without affecting the full-length receptor. So that gave us proof that these smaller forms are due to this cryptic exon. Not only could we knock down uh, expression of these variants, now we could uh, induce specific expression of these variants. And so we created um, uh, expression constructs. Uh, this construct is against, uh, expresses the entire full-length androgen receptor, exons 1 through 8, and you can see that when small amounts of this is expressed in cells, we get uh, androgen-dependent activity, and when larger amounts are expressed in cells, we get even more androgen-dependent activity uh, expressed. However, when we express the uh, uh, one of these variants that has this cryptic exon, we only get constitutive activity at low levels of expression and even more constitutive androgen independent activity at higher expression levels. And this is true for the other uh, uh, variant that we observed as well. Increased constitutive activity from these variants. So again, back to the take-home message. Uh, the full-length androgen receptor, and again, I've lost my pointer, so let's see if we can... Okay, so we've got the full-length receptor uh, which binds to the androgen uh, and induced by androgens. And we have these variants that lack, they lack this steroid binding domain 
but they still contain both the transcriptional activation domain as well as the DNA binding domain. So they're constitutively active and they do not require androgen to uh, activate genes. After we reported our findings of uh, androgen receptor variants, uh, other laboratories uh, reported um, uh, variants that are very interesting. These are some data from Dr. Uh, Steve Plymate's laboratory uh, where he has expressed one of these variants uh, in, uh, again, a castration resistant cell line. He also expressed the full length androgen receptor. This is in the absence of androgen or in the presence of androgen. So you can see that the, the, the full length androgen receptor in the absence of androgen is largely in the cytoplasm of cells. And in the presence of androgen, they are largely in the nucleus of cells. So androgens are binding to the androgen receptor, driving those, receptor to the nu those receptors to the nucleus, and activating gene transcription. Whereas this variant that Dr. Plymate expressed in these cells is in the nucleus even in the absence of androgen and remain in the nucleus in the presence of androgen. So this demonstrates that they're in the nucleus and he's, uh, he has other experiments demonstrating that these receptors are transcriptionally active uh, in these cells. Another laboratory uh, developed uh, uh, an antibody against one of these variants. And this shows data from Dr. Young Shu's laboratory at University of Maryland, where she developed uh, an antibody against a variant um, that she calls AR3 variant, and looked at expression of this, this variant either in benign prostate tumors, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, benign prostate uh, tissue, or hormone naive. Uh, prostate tumors. These are tumors that have not been treated with androgen ablation or uh, hormone resistant or castration resistant tumors. And you can see that there's very low expression in uh, benign tissue uh, and more expression in uh, hormone naive uh, prostate tumors and even more expression in castration resistant tumors. Our laboratory has been interested in the question of whether these variants have specific target genes that will uh, drive uh, proliferation of these castration resistant uh, tumors. And you can see here an experiment where we use shRNA to knock down both forms of the receptor or just the full length receptor. And you can see here the expression profile of genes in these different uh, conditions. And you can see the expression profiles are different in these three different conditions. We compared the expression profile of uh, these two cohorts and found about a thousand genes. We then compared expression profile of just knocking down the full length uh, receptor and leaving uh, expression of the variants. And again, we got about a thousand genes. And about 700 of these genes are common uh, and overlap uh, under these two experimental conditions. When we compared the, uh, the gene uh, signaling pathways that appear to be regulated by these variants or the full length receptor, we find uh, that lipid metabolism is very similar as are cell death genes. 
However, when we get to genes that are involved in cellular assembly or DNA replication, you can see that there are differences in these uh, pathways that are being affected uh, by these uh, two different uh, receptor populations. So again, I'd like to uh, uh, summarize our key concepts. One is that the prostate needs the androgen receptor to survive. Second, that following androgen ablation therapy, prostate cancer cells develop androgen independent mechanisms to activate the androgen receptor. We have evidence that the androgen receptor is activated at one end by androgens and at the other end by androgen independent mechanisms. And finally, these androgen receptor variants appear to be activated only by androgen independent mechanisms. I would like to acknowledge the people in my laboratory that have uh, done uh, the majority of this work. Uh, Dr. Scott Dane has gone on to the University of Minnesota uh, where he is on the faculty and he's continuing to work uh, with these androgen receptor variants. He was the original discoverer of the androgen receptor uh, variants. Uh, other laboratory members contributed to this work. Uh, we have collaborators that are very important to helping us with reagents and cell lines. And then finally, the funding, which is very important for our research. Uh, I will be happy to answer uh, questions at this point. Okay, here, here are the questions that um, I've had. Um, let me, one is there are reports supporting a, com a complete lack of androgen receptor in some subpopulations of prostate cancer. Uh, how do these cells survive and grow? Let's see if I can get the complete. Okay, here's the, here's the complete, uh, uh, and, and uh, how do they s survive and grow and what is their contribution in castration resistant development in patients? Uh, this is a very uh, important question, uh, and, and that brings us to the point that the prostate uh, tumor is highly heterogeneous. And so in those tumors that have uh, been removed from patients, uh, we find uh, regions that contain uh, expression of the androgen receptor. Uh, and however, there are regions that do not express the androgen receptor. Uh, also, there are, um, uh, there are institutions that have been able to obtain uh, metastatic uh, tissues um, right after autopsy or during autopsy and they've measured androgen receptors in these tumors. And again, they found a high heterogeneity of, uh, in the tumors as well as heterogeneity in expression of the androgen receptor. I would say in the complete absence of androgen, some of these cell signaling pathways uh, take over in the absence of the androgen receptor, such as the TNF-alpha pathway. Uh, another pathway that we've studied in our own laboratory uh, is um, called the 
uh, P-team, uh, AKT pathway, um, uh, this pathway uh, is very important for androgen independent uh, regulation of these cells, but can also uh, regulate um, cells in the complete absence of the androgen receptor. So I would say the answer to that question lies in these other signaling pathways that take over in the absence of the androgen receptor. That was a very good question. Thank you. The uh, next question is, is there a crosstalk between the androgen receptor, the uh, EGF receptor, the epidermal growth factor receptor, and the IGF-1 receptor in castration-resistant prostate cancer cell lines, for example, LNCAP. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, it's obvious that the uh, person who uh, submitted this question uh, is very attuned to what pathways are important in progression of prostate cancer. And indeed, there's evidence that there's crosstalk uh, between uh, these pathways. And so I think um, the take-home message uh, at this point is that this is a very complex uh, cellular milieu. Um, although we try to break them down into simple concepts that we can understand, uh, certainly uh, the complexity uh, is not diminished by our concepts. And so I think many pharmaceutical companies are um, looking at multiple ways by which these multiple pathways can be inhibited either together uh, or in uh, combination uh, as tumors uh, progress. Um, we hope that some of our research will uh, help in identifying some of these pathways uh, to target and um, we hope that our research will contribute in a small way to uh, fighting this devastating uh, disease. I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank you for your questions. Those were very good questions. And uh, finally, I would like to remind you to obtain continuing education credits. Uh, go to the uh, website, the URL that's shown on this slide. Thank you very much for your attention.